Once again, good morning. good morning. Just when I said it was a low Sunday, everybody appeared. So this is wonderful. It's good to be together. Our service of worship and thanksgiving continues on 355 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 355. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us give glory to God, singing the hymn on page 356, page 356. Lord be with you. Let us pray. We'll pray the collect, which may be found on your insert. We'll pray the contemporary translation. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. of the apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 133, which can be found on your insert. We will say it responsibly, beginning and ending with the refrain together. How good and pleasant it is to live in unity. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. 
upon the beard of Aaron and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hill of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. How good and pleasant it is to live in unity. Our second reading is from the first letter of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what it is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our sequence hymn, hymn 209, hymn 209.
This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hand and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I was walking on Friday in Chelsea in Manhattan, right by General Theological Seminary, where I took many classes and suffered through my general ordination exams. So there's some uh, <laughs> traumatic memories there. But anyway, it's a beautiful block in Chelsea. And I was walking by, and they were assembling some kind of event or party on the, you know, on the clothes of General Seminary, just the enclosed, beautiful garden that they have. And there were these human-sized cages that were like coming out of the truck. And of course, I, you know, in a snarky way, quipped because everybody needs a, a cage, right? And so I thought more about it during the rest of the day, and I thought, you know, we all kind of live in a cage of our own making, if we really think about it hard enough. And um, I was, you know, thinking about this passage for this Sunday, and what struck me was, of course, the way, in the very beginning of the passage, right, they're closed in, the doors are locked, they're encaged in a way, and Jesus enters in among them. But I think also it's more than just sort of the shutness and the lockedness of the space. I think, again, it's about the cages, the emotional and spiritual cages that we find ourselves in that Jesus comes to break through and to set us free. And I think the chief example of that in this story, who's kind of like the, the protagonist, maybe the antagonist in this story? Who's the main character? Thomas, right? You all probably know this passage about doubting Thomas. And I think doubting Thomas is in a cage of his own making. Now, doubting Thomas gets a bad rap because he actually is one of the most earnest and faithful of the disciples. 
And there are various times during Jesus' ministry when Thomas is like the first one, you know, to say, I'm right there with you, Lord. I'm right there with you. But, you know, Thomas gets a bad rap because he's called Doubting Thomas. You know, he's not there. And basically, what does Doubting Thomas say? I want to see it. I want the proof, right? Especially like in our culture nowadays, you know, I want the facts. I want to see it with my own eyes. And so you can't really blame him, right? Most of us are probably like that most of the time. So I think he gets a bad rap, and I think all of us find ourselves there. But I was thinking more about this passage, and I, as I said, I saw this cage on 22nd Street, so I was thinking about cages. And you know that I love etymology, which is sort of like, you know, the root meaning of a word. And so I was wondering, what is the root meaning of doubt, and what is the root meaning of belief? Because you probably think this passage is about, well, you know, Thomas isn't there, so he doesn't believe that Jesus, you know, really rose from the dead, and so then he has to come and believe. And so it's kind of like an intellectual thing, like a rational thing, like, you know, do you believe this logical proposition to be true or not? And I think that kind of gets us off track a little bit. And so I was looking into the root meaning of the word, and it was very helpful, because the word, from, the word doubt comes from a Latin word to hesitate, to hesitate. And the word belief comes from a German word, belieben, which is to give your heart to, to give your heart to, to open your heart. So it's not so much like a rational thing, as much as it is a state of the heart. And if there's anything that we know about Jesus' ministry, Jesus cares about the state of your heart. He cares about your intention. And so Thomas, he's hesitating. He doesn't have an open heart to the reality of new life and new love amongst the disciples. Now, I always say this, I think there are just two forces in the universe. Two forces in the universe. So what do you think those two forces are? Good and evil, yes. What did you say? Love. Yes, I would say love and fear. I would say love and fear are the two forces of the universe. And the entire spiritual journey is about how do you move from fear to love. Or maybe, how do you return to love? You know, maybe if you're like me, maybe if you're like Thomas, you started in love, and this cold, cruel world hurt you in some way. And so you say, I am not gonna be hurt again, right? Think about Thomas. He was one of the most earnest and faithful of the disciples. He opened and gave his heart to this man, and this man left him. And I think he is afraid of opening his heart once again. But Jesus says, do not hesitate. Do not keep your heart closed off, but open your heart. And so that's what happens. But what is the way in which it happens? This is sort of another key aspect of this passage that I want to dig into. What is the way that it happens? What does Jesus do? What's that? Yeah, but specifically, what does Jesus do? He, yes, he has Thomas touch the wounds. Touch the wounds. Now, what does Jesus spend his whole ministry doing? He is touching wounds. Jesus is constantly preaching, teaching, and healing by touching people who are wounded in the hopes that they will be healed. And now he's the one saying, here, touch my wounds. The fancy word for this is vulnerability. Vulnerability. Jesus' whole ministry and the key to accessing the divine is learning to be vulnerable, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Jesus shows it, teaches it in his ministry, and that is what he continues to do after he is raised. 
he is vulnerable and shows his wounds. Now, if you're like me, the last thing you, you want to do when you have a wound is you want to show it, expose it, right? Maybe you want to hide in a corner and lick the wound. But Jesus is showing that this is how healing happens. This is how healing happens. And so Thomas goes from fear to love to being restored and reconciled amongst the disciples. So also, this past Friday, I watched a Netflix movie called Miracle Club. Has anyone seen it? It is um, a movie with Maggie Smith, love her, right? Uh, Kathy Bates, love her, right? And also Laura Linney, love her. She also lives in Salisbury, so she's kind of a neighbor. Anyway, it takes place in Ireland in the late 60s. Have you seen this movie? You've, you have seen it, okay. So anyway, it's about these three, actually there's four women, so those actresses and a fourth younger woman, and it takes place in the late 60s, and they, they want to go to Lourdes in France. So you all know Lourdes of Litchfield, right? Well, Lourdes of Litchfield is modeled on the real Lourdes, Lourdes in France, and basically in Lourdes, there was an apparition of the Virgin Mary um, to a young girl named Bernadette, and then after that, she continued to appear, and there were many miraculous cures. So these three women from Ireland, they want to go to Lourdes, and they enter like this talent show, this parish talent show. Maybe we should do this at St. Paul's. And um, they end up winning this trip to Lourdes. And basically, um, they are all a strange. There's one amongst them, and they are estranged from her because she left 40 years ago, went to America, never came back. Um, Nancy's smiling. Have you seen this movie by any chance? Anyway, so they have so much resentment because she left and she never came back, and she didn't come back until her mother died. So they go to Lourdes, and they're expecting a miracle. You know, for various health issues, and they're totally disappointed. And finally, one of them asked the nuns, you know, so how many miracles have there been here at Lourdes? And the nun says 62. And initially, Maggie Smith said, well, that's not bad for a day, 62 miracles in a day. The nun's like, no. Well, okay, that's not bad for a week, uh, 62 miracles every week. No, there's been 62 miracles total since the Virgin Mary appeared to little Bernadette in the mid-1800s. Betsy's, Betsy's smiling and laughing. So they are so upset, they say, this is such a sham, there's not going to be any miracle here. And, um, you know, they're ready to go back home. And then finally, the youngest woman amongst them breaks down because she had come to Lourdes because her son, who's maybe like four or five years old, has not ever spoken a word in his life. And so she was hoping that there would be a miracle and her son would speak. And so she breaks down and she says, you know, I have something to confess to you all. She says, um, when I was pregnant with my son, I tried to have a miscarriage. And so this is this enormous confession, and she thinks that it's because she had attempted that, that God is punishing her, and her son won't speak. So then, the woman who was estranged from them, who went to America and they hated because she never came back, she said, you know, the reason I left was because I got pregnant. And I went to America, and basically she ended up, I think, living with nuns in a convent, and um, she ended up um, arranging to have a miscarriage. So this mutual confession and this mutual vulnerability amongst the women then allows them to feel that it's okay to once again love one another. And so the other woman says to her, you know, I loved you, and then you left, and I hated you. But I never hated you more than I loved you. And so they don't get a miracle in Lourdes the way they think they're going to get the miracle, but the miracle is there because the miracle is the love and the vulnerability that allows them once more to experience love. 
And so it's the vulnerability that is the key that opens up the love and sets them free. So, of course, I have to read to you a quote. And I had some tech difficulties today, so I'm reading this one directly off my phone. I wasn't able to print it. But this is, of course, um, what you know who um, says about resurrection. Resurrection through connection is how this uh, um, passage is titled. We don't need to wait for death to experience resurrection. We can begin resurrection today by living connected to God. Resurrection happens every time we love someone, even though they were not very loving to us. At that moment, we have been brought to new life. Every time we decide to trust and begin again, even after repeated failures, at that moment, we've been resurrected. Every time we refuse to become negative, cynical, hopeless, we have experienced the risen Christ. We don't have to wait for it later. Resurrection is always possible now. The resurrection is not Jesus' private miracle. It's the new shape of reality. It's the new shape of the world. It's filled with grace. It's filled with possibility. It's filled with newness. The resurrection is not a miracle story to prove the divinity of Christ, something that makes him the winner. It's a storyline that allows us all to be winners, all, no exception. There's no eternal death for anybody. All are invited to draw upon this infinite source, this infinite mystery, this infinite love, this infinite possibility. Spiritually speaking, we live in a world of abundance, of infinity, but most of us walk around as if it were not true, operating in a world of scarcity where there's never enough. There's not enough for me, there's not enough for you, there's not enough for anybody. And so we hoard it, spirit, love, life to ourselves. We hoard grace, we hoard mercy. We don't allow ourselves to be conduits through which it pours into the world. Truly, the only way we can hold on to grace, mercy, love, joy, any spiritual gift is to give them away consciously and intentionally. Once we stop acting as a conduit, we lose them ourselves. So you may have heard the phrase, it's from the Bible, by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds we are healed. And a lot of times we interpret that very abstractly or we interpret it um, in the sense that Christ paid some debt for us and that may certainly be true. But often it's much more literal than that. By touching our wounds and touching other wounds, we are healed and we can experience God's grace and love flow through us. And that's how we can move from doubt and hesitation to belief and giving our hearts to love. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. May our works be my favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. May they be delivered in your distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. We pray especially today for love and healing for Abigail, for Ron, for Mike and family, for Bob, for Bruce, for Charlotte, for Chris, for Richard, for Tom and Doris, for Felix, for Stephen, for Jim. For Joanne, for Juliana, for Kevin, for Ruth, for Nancy, for Naomi's family, for Paula, for the Rose family, for Sammy, for Susie, for Diane, and for Karen, for any others on our hearts or on our lips at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember Ollie and all companion pets that have passed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those struggling with addiction and for their families and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of Gaza and all who suffer in war-torn places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the repose of the soul and life and love eternal for Neil and for comfort for his wife, Phyllis. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for the repose of the soul and for life and love eternal for Nathan Lee and for comfort for all of his family, friends, and loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Are there any prayers in the basket today? No. Turning now to page 395, let's pray together the concluding collect number six in the middle of the page on page 395. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. 
May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet one another in Christ. First is that we will have, I think, a brief supplemental parish meeting after the service. Um, you may recall that we had our annual parish meeting in February and we tabled discussion of the treasurer's report. So um, we will have that briefly after the service today. Um, hopefully Roy and Jean will join us from sunny Florida on June, so fingers crossed on the tech issues there. Um, we have a lovely coffee hour afterwards, um, hosted by Nina and Denise. Thank you, as always. And upcoming this month, we have a few special things. So on the third Sunday, which I think is the 21st of April, we're going to have a reprise of our Earth Day event last year. Lori, do you want to come up and say a little bit about the Earth Day event on Sunday the 21st? Okay. <laughs> 21st on Sunday after coffee hour, I was wondered if anyone would like to please help out with the Earth Day event out in the back parking lot. There's a lot of projects out there. I don't know which one we'll start on. It all depends if we spread the wood chips or the barbecue pits are leaving to be repaired and put in a new spot so we could prep that part for our garden. So there's a lot to do, so I would love for anybody to join me out there. Thank you, Lori. So this is uh, Sunday the 21st, after coffee hour, and we'll have uh, refreshments, uh, I believe, right, Lori, as well for Cold folks? Drinks. Cold drinks. Um, so Sunday the 21st. And I also want to mention Lori, because she has really spearheaded um, our hoped for healing path that will be in the beautiful um, wooded property uh, behind the church building. And just last week, I think it was last week, um, during Holy Week, we learned that we were successful in getting a grant for $800. And Lori spearheaded that, so that will go into the ongoing development of the path. So I just want to um, give a shout out once again to Lori Parsons, who does so much um, and whose leadership is so invaluable. So thank you, Lori, for that. Yes, a round of applause in order. And the only other April event I can think of is the fourth Sunday of this month. We will have Breakfast Church at Christ Church. So they host us for Breakfast Church four times a year. So this is the second time that they'll be hosting us. And if you were here um, for Easter Day last uh, week, you may recall that Anne announced that our vestry uh, voted at the last vestry meeting to explore the possibility of merger. So this is very exciting. And so this is an opportunity once more to share in a special kind of worship and fellowship. So that is the fourth Sunday of this month. It'll be Breakfast Church in the Parish Hall at Christ Church Bethlehem. Any other announcements? Yes, Nina. Uh, we 
Thank you, Nina, yes. So uh, sign-up sheet for coffee hour is behind the piano. There are still some open slots, so if you're willing um, to host a coffee hour, and does not have to be elaborate, it can be orange juice and Entenmann's coffee cake, um, or even less, it's really an opportunity just to gather for fellowship after the service. So thank you for the reminder, Nina. Um, and please join us today if you're able for coffee hour after the meeting. Live in love as Christ loves us and gives himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Our offertory hymn is 208, hymn 208. Thanksgiving may be found on page 367 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 367. The Lord be with you. Open your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven. 
sheep there we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Savior Christ has taught us 